Hey, what's happening? Chris Martinez. I am the host of Operation Agency Freedom. And on today's episode, I have the amazing Austin Erebor. Now, you might not know who he is. Uh, his agency is called NetFly Digital. But this dude is crushing it. He went from 30000 a month to $530,000 a month. That's right. $530,000 a month in about a year and a half. I think he said 18 months, if I remember correctly. So that is absolutely insane growth. He specializes in the legal niche. There's a lot of people that are in legal, but there's not a lot of people that are doing 530 grand a month. And he's managing everything with just, uh, I think he said 12 people. And so if you are interested in how an agency can have explosive growth, like what Austin is putting up, then you definitely want to pay attention to today's episode. I've known Austin for about a year. He's a super humble guy. You would never guess by looking at him that he's putting up those kinds of numbers. And he's not the type of person who's going to be like, you know, bragging, bragging to everybody about how much revenue he's doing and the multiple seven figure, blah, blah, blah. Just a great guy. So pay attention to this episode. We do a little trigger warning for you. We do talk a little bit about racism victimization, uh, things like that. So if that is going to ruffle your feathers today, then don't listen. Otherwise, pay attention because you're going to learn a lot from Austin and his story. So with that being said, let's jump over to the episode. All right, super excited. I am stoked to have Austin Irabor here on the show. He's coming in from... Los Angeles, well, I should say east of Los Angeles in, uh, well, what city is it specifically? Specifically, it's Eastvale, California. Eastvale. Right outside of Chino Hills, yeah. All right. Yeah, I got a lot of family out in Riverside, San Bernardino, Colton. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, we used to go oh, out there all the time, yeah, right off the 91. Mm -hmm. So uh, stoked to have you here. We met probably, I think we probably met like online almost yeah. a year ago because you jumped into one of my coaching sessions that I was doing back in the day, mm -hmm. but formally got to meet you face to face back in March and man, your agency has been growing like crazy. So huge congratulations there. Um, Thanks, before we get into that, I want to kind of hear um, your backstory, you know, like how did you get started in the agency world and what is it that you guys are, you know, focusing on in on in your agency so let's hear it. What's what's the backstory? Sure. So um, <clears throat> I think I, I my first kind of dabble into digital marketing was just kind of doing it for myself. I got into real estate pretty pretty young, pretty early. This was mm -hmm. right before the crash, so I experienced the highs and the lows of that. But I learned how to post stuff online. I built myself a little website. Started mm -hmm. learning digital marketing, things of that nature, to try to like generate motivated sellers and things like that. Okay. Um, fast forward, the economy does what it does. Uh, I wind up, you know, going back to school, but you know, when you're in school, you still have to kind of support yourself and things like mm -hmm. that. So I would cold call owners of crappy websites built by a company called web.com. Okay. Uh, yep. Cause I could like search for them, you know? Um, yep. and I said, Hey, you're, you've got a crappy website from web.com. I will build you a better one and we will host it on my reseller server. And, uh, you know, you'll pay me a hundred bucks a month. So I just did a bunch of that wound up with a little bit of passive income to this day, Chris, I still make money from that, from that server. Wow. And, um, yeah, so I, I started doing that. I got a little VA and that got my feet wet in offering services. Fast forward. I finished school. I played rugby, um, in college. My rugby coach happened to be best friends with a politician in Colorado and Colorado just so happens to have a town called Glendale, which mm -hmm. is like the kind of the epicenter for rugby in, in America, if there is one, but he was the mayor of that town. So I got to meet him and he, he says, Hey, look, I'm going to run for governor of this state. I'm going to use my money. I'm going to do it independently. And I just need people that I can trust. You're part of the rugby group, uh, you know, fraternity, this guy trusts you. I'm going to trust you. So let's do this thing. I, you've got enough experience for me. So just like that, I was thrust into a, a campaign for governor of the state of Colorado. I became the digital marketing manager for that. That was my first job out of school. No wow. applications, nothing. And uh, yeah, I got to spend a whole lot of somebody else's money in a really short period of time, learned how to use data, learned what kind of data was out there. 
the things I could do, couldn't do, what was compliant, what wasn't, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we did not win, but we were able to, you know, we, I don't know if this still stands, but it was the most financially efficient campaign of all time in Colorado at the time. And I uh, just came from like creativity, using the data that we had and the money that we had to, to make something out of it. So uh, how close, was, how close was the campaign? It was not close, Chris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it lost. was efficient. It wasn't close, yeah. but it was damn efficient. We lost. It was we damn lost efficient. efficient. <laughs> I can take credit for the efficiency. <laughs> not a close race, not by one bit. That's okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, you know, I, I got to decide, you know, uh, I had a choice. I could work for the mayor or I could go do something for somebody else who was running for something because I had a ton of experience now or enough and I had pedigree now, but I decided politics wasn't for me. I didn't want to pursue that as a career. So I went back home to SoCal. As you know, being a SoCal guy, <clears throat> we have a, a little bit of a tech bubble here as well, just like mm -hmm. NorCal does. So I got involved in that, started working with startups. I helped a couple startups reach the 5,000. Uh, I helped a startup that has since moved over to China and blown up over there. And I got to sit down with actual incubators and accelerators. I was invited mm -hmm. in and I would like build game plans with teams. And I would say, I'm going to build this game plan for you and I'm going to host it online and I'm going to track how often you guys are using it to see your growth and stuff like that. So that was really fun. And I it built a lot of confidence and I started my own agency because I wanted to do it for myself. Mm -hmm. And for a while I was working with startups because that was kind of what I just come from, mm -hmm. but I didn't like that because there were so many things outside of your control that happen in the startup yeah. world that you can do your job right and still not have one after. So I decided to do my own thing with small businesses, you know, the old small business niche started there. And then I started focusing on lawyers because once upon a time I was very close to taking the LSAT and going to law school. I think I may have gone that track if not for the things that happened, you know, leading up to this decision. So I started working with lawyers about maybe six years ago. Mm -hmm. The company is about eight years old now. Mm -hmm. And I was stuck at around 30 K for for many years and around the time that I'd met you, I'd started to see some growth and improvements and things like that in my operation. And now we're at about just over 530 per month in a month. Or wow. So you went from 30 to 530 in how much time? Uh, just under two years. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. So yeah. Anybody who's listening, their ears just perked up if they weren't paying attention. So definitely <laughs> pay attention to everything that we're going to talk about from here on out. Uh, pull over the car, start taking notes. But seriously, like it is really, really impressive how quickly you've been able to scale the agency. I've heard you say in the past, and I'm, I might be paraphrasing here, but you sell, you sell expensive shit to rich people. <laughs> I do. Yeah. <laughs> so like elaborate on that more because it sounds easier than it is to actually execute on most of the time. So like what, what has been your path to be able to get to where you're at now by yeah. selling expensive shit to rich people? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I think it starts honestly from a place of knowing what's out there and just being frustrated with clients like in general, right? Okay. So you, you can try to work really hard for people that you, you feel have potential, but maybe they're just, they don't have the operational makeup mm -hmm. or they don't have the budget to really support the goals that they have. Yep. And they're leaning on agencies a lot of the time, way too much to just generate quote unquote, good leads that mm -hmm. essentially sell themselves so that they don't have to clean up their problems. So I started focusing on the upper end or that like capstone, if we think of like the pyramid of, of clients where like very few clients have tons of money where lots of clients don't have much. I just switched my focus up to the top and I said, what can we build and what can we deliver for this enterprise type of client? What would they mm -hmm. be open to listening to? What can we build for them? And then how can we like hammer home results that get mm -hmm. them to spend more and more and more money with us? And uh, that's basically. And so I started focusing on the top of the personal injury uh, market and um, offering services that were expensive, but delivered results. And we can talk about how we do that as well. My first question before we get to that is how do you get them to pick up the phone? Because if they have money, like, mm -hmm. you know, like you're here in Southern California. So you, we've seen the commercials for Larry H. Parker since yeah. we were little kids, yeah, right? Yeah. So like, that's who I think of when I think of big name personal injury attorneys. Mm -hmm. It's the Larry Parkers of the world. And yep. they must get pitched 
a hundred times a day. I get pitched yep. 20 yeah. times a day. Yeah. You know? So yeah. how is it that you're able to get your foot in the door? Someone gets their foot in the door for me, or I should say I leverage people that already have that foot in the door. So we use a lot of, or I shouldn't say we use a lot of, but we, we rely heavily on relationships that we have, or I should say JV partnerships that we have mm -hmm. with consultants in the space. So mm -hmm. we have friendships with some of the, I have personal friendships with some of the best consultants in the industry and they know what I do. I can show them the back end results and I can say, this is it. This is what we do. This is who it's for. If you've got a client that's like that, let's have that conversation. It'll be non-salesy. I'm not here to sell people stuff that they don't need. Um, we're just looking for great fits. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, and I just remind those people that we exist and because we have that relationship, they have no problem recommending me. Sometimes there's, they don't even want anything. They just want for their clients to, to be in good hands and, and things like that. So relationships matter guys. And we probably don't do enough relationship building in the agency world because we're sure. behind a computer all day. But if I had someone in your niche that needed services, I would have no problem recommending them to you because I know you're a cool guy and you're going to take care of them and that you're going to turn them away if you can't. Yeah. And that's just the vibe that I give. And it's at the point where people know that if Austin says it, it's going to happen. So it's been, it's, it's been a matter of turning people away that are bad fits at this point, even though they have tons of money. Uh, we've, I've literally personally put people on ice for months and months and months because it's like, you don't have what it takes to work with us yet. Why don't you come back when you do? And that, that's, and a game changer as well. So let's take it a step further then. How did you get the relationship with the JV partner or the influencer or whoever? Great. That then like, and how did you nurture that relationship? Because that doesn't happen overnight. You know, that can yeah, take great. years. Yeah, great question. Well, just so happens consultants tend to be more accessible than end clients, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Okay. So they'll answer the phone. I just pitch the idea that, hey, let's build some value together. I want to do something for you. I want to put you front and center in front of my existing client roster to introduce you to people that already know, like, and trust me mm -hmm. and have you generate some value for them. So almost like a, a private webinar style video mm -hmm. where we can use it as kind of like a quick start or a refresher or something that delivers value to my existing clients. No pressure, no, what's the word? No call to action at the end. In mm -hmm. fact, it's going to be branded for us or co-branded where you can say your name and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but we're going to have our little logo on it. It's our asset, but you're delivering it. And then when somebody wants say sales coaching, or they want to, they want to hire, they, they want to make their next hire or something like that. <clears throat> they're going to, they're going to know your name and, and, and things of that nature. So it, there's value upfront that I'm offering them. And it's an opportunity to talk to my existing clients. And then that expands to, Hey, that was great. You know, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. And then that expands to, Hey, if you know anybody that wants to work on a really cool campaign, here's how it looks. Right. And so they're just open to that. So I don't go for the sale. I just go by offering some, some upfront value in exchange for their work. So, and if they're up for that, then they're usually up for the rest of it. You'd mentioned yeah. that you also share some result campaign results which is really, really important because mm -hmm. if you can prove that you can get results for clients, yeah. then selling is like way easier, right? Because mm -hmm. they don't feel like they're the guinea pig and you've got a proven track record. How much do you disclose to the consultants when you're developing that relationship? I show them all the major KPIs. I just, I only show them the names of clients that are okay with that. So okay. a client that might be okay with being on the website or doing an interview. Mm -hmm. style uh, situation, uh, what do you call it, case study, mm -hmm. and that's cool. But I show them all the other KPIs and they're like, damn, this is, okay, this, this is working. So that's that answer. I think you, I want to go back to what you just said though, in terms of results, it's not just that we offer a thing that has like good results, because the truth is you can have the same campaign for two different clients, but end up with a completely different result. Correct. Right. So part of our deliverable and why we can charge a lot for it is because you're not just getting marketing. You're not just getting some leads mm -hmm. that we dump into your inbox and say, good luck. We hope this works out. You're getting leads. And then we monitor your rate of sale. We monitor how many people you're still chasing, how many people are pending, how many people you're not reaching. We have a, what they call a concierge style system as well that gets added to that that allows us to call down some of your leads, live transfer them in, right? So if you're, if your intake is dropping the ball, we're going to tell you, we're going to say, Hey, 
Chris over an intake took him way too long to pick up the phone. He wasn't nice to the client and you're mm -hmm. probably going to lose this deal, right? You might want to talk to Chris and they appreciate that very much. Clients crave back end consulting. They crave it because they know that they need it. They know that they have problems that they need to fix. Yep. And they really appreciate it when somebody tells them that and reminds them, Hey, you've got this person on your team that could still use some coaching. Yeah. Um, I love so this. Yeah. I talked about this actually almost exactly a year ago about how marketing and sales was converging, right? Because historically, agencies would generate the phone calls or the form submissions. They would generate the leads. And then those leads get transferred over to somebody else in that company. And that person is responsible for following up and scheduling the call and making sure that they actually show up. And that becomes a true sales opportunity. Right. But what happens is that their in-house person sucks. Like back over 10 years ago when I was doing lead generation or selling lead generation services, I would listen to these calls. And I remember specifically there was this guy, he had inherited the business from his dad who had passed away. It was a custom kitchen cabinet business. And I'm listening to this guy call, answer a, a phone call. And he literally picks up the phone and says, yep. <laughs> Oh. And you can hear <laughs> machinery going off in the background. Yeah. And the, and the person who's calling is like, hi, is this da-da-da? He's like, yep, what's up? Yeah, Just, no. Bro, yeah. are you trying to repel money? Like, what the hell's going yeah. on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the time you have these clients who they're relying on some of their lowest paid employees to bring right. in all the revenue. Yes. Right. Yes. And so, and those employees don't have a great incentive to do some great job. And mm -hmm. so what they wind up doing is working really hard on the stuff that they like or like the lead sources that they enjoy, which is typically referrals, branded searches, things of that nature. And then the stuff that they have to put any work on, they don't build a skill set relevant to campaigns. They just kind of do stuff. And unfortunately, we get the blame for that as agency owners. Yes. So I always give the analogy of, let's say you're not a client in niche XYZ, you're a surgeon. Okay. And you've hired us to do your marketing and we put a hundred people on your table and 97 of those people die. You have a marketing problem or do you have a surgery problem? Right? Because right. we brought them in, we brought them onto the table, but you didn't fix them. You killed them. So let's lower the kill rate here. Let's increase the rate of proper surgeries by sharpening your tool. Love it. What do you think prospect? Yeah. Yeah. That's a no brainer type of question. Pun intended with the surgery analogy. So now you've got this, you know, agent agency that's thriving, right? Let's talk right. about the team that you've built is along the way, because it's not just you. Around how many employees do you have now? We're down to twelve. I had fourteen before last week. We're down to twelve. I'm going to replace the people with some agency work, like some white labeling. Yeah. But we've got a couple concierges. They're like specialized in their range of concierge work. I have a marketing manager who does all of the organizational side stuff. I have a, a junior associate under her who basically works for her. The manager answers to me. I have a executive assistant slash Swiss army knife, you know, smarter than me, second brain person. I have a development person who mm -hmm. is essentially the gatekeeper. I have a in-house, what do you call it? Like sales coach mm -hmm. over the clients as well. Okay. We have an organizational side SEO team too, composed of two people. So the SEO manager and then the content writer underneath him. So the writer and the manager work together and they're basically working on improving our rank internally for the team. And then on the outsourcing side, we outsource some of the PPC work. I still okay. do some of the PPC work. I still consider myself kind of an artisan with that. Mm -hmm. And then now we just became a hybrid program. Literally last week, we signed our first SEO uh, client. Okay. So uh, we're doing that now and we're going to lean on some white label providers for that as well. So when you yeah. look at revenue per employee, you're upwards of 500K plus revenue per employee, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah. Right. If you got 12 yeah. employees, you're doing about 530 a month. It comes out to about 530 per employee, which is fantastic. Anything above 300,000 is freaking amazing. You guys are at like half a million per employee, which is incredible. How do you manage to man keep everything running with such a low headcount? You know what the beauty of what we're doing here is that a lot of it is, I guess I'm more prone to a conveyor belt type of factory type of strategy, right? Yeah. Which is why I was so prone to white labeling some of the SEO work. I mean, some of it's going to be 
managed in house by, mm -hmm. you know, the internal people, but the low end kind of grunt work, we're mm -hmm. just going to farm that out because we know that it can be done by most anybody. And the, on the content side, we're leaning on the best content provider in the space. I just like putting the best stuff together for the client and then packaging that and giving that to the client. So there's that when it comes to non SEO stuff, when it comes to the PPC stuff, we are a copy paste type of agency where you can have it in any color so long as it's black, right? Mm -hmm. The strategies are all R and D out before they get even promoted. And we only work in certain specific sub niches. So personal injury, family mm -hmm. immigration, I'm missing one. Well, those are the big three right now. We do a little bit of bankruptcy, but we've gotten away from it. I just don't like the, I don't like the clients. I don't like their clients, Okay. but yeah. So by keeping it super, super focused on what we're doing and then having a conveyor belt type of strategy where everything, everybody's getting the same potato and we know that it works because we've already are indeed it. All mm -hmm. it leaves is one last variable, which is the client themselves and the sales mm -hmm. and the logistics and stuff like that. And then we just pick a good pony, right? So. I mentioned the SDR, his job is to be the gatekeeper. Nobody gets to see mm -hmm. the wizard unless they're qualified to do so. Yep. So they have to be down with doing things the net fly way. We, we're going to ask some qualifying questions. We come in as a skeptic, not them. Mm -hmm. And we say, Hey, this is the way it is. I'm going to talk to you about what we do in a non salesy way. We don't sell. We just show and tell. Mm -hmm. And if I think you're going to be a good fit, then you get to talk to the wizard. And then I'm the wizard. And then I further qualify and the clients actually really appreciate it. It gives uh -huh. a sense of quality to what we're doing as opposed to, Hey, we'll work with anybody that can fog a mirror. I'd say super duplicatable service. That's already been R and D out, not launching something in a new sub niche, unless it's mm -hmm. already been R and D out and then telling everybody, everybody's going to get the same potato on pushing that into high level. And then just training the client in five minutes on how to do that, drag and drop things, etc. That's been the key is uh, duplication. I love it. And and a lot of people think that if I'm going to get these bigger clients, everything's got to be custom. It's got to be super, super complicated. So you've kind of proven that that's not necessarily the case, that you can have a very templated type of ad strategy yeah. or marketing strategy and, and, and charge a lot of money for it. Templated doesn't mean it's lower quality. It just means that you've done the R and D you've done the, the research on it. You've built out a great funnel. You've built out great automations. If you build something really great, you deserve to get paid a lot for it. Uh, you should not try to give it to people who cannot appreciate it as well, because what's going to happen is you you only have one reputation here. So you really don't want to burn it on bad fit. What you've got right now, if what you can literally build today is good for the mid tier, then only sell it to the mid tier. If it's good for the top tier, only sell it to the top tier. Don't sell it to the wrong fits. Don't sell it to the wrong tier because that's going to hurt you in the end. That's great advice. So I want to kind of shift gears here and talk about you and your own personal development because the Austin that was running the $30,000 a month agency is much different than the Austin that's running the $530,000 a month agency. Yep. What are some of the, and I know that this is a very broad and kind of a difficult question to answer in 10 minutes or less, but what are some of the changes that you've personally undergone in yeah. scaling up your agency? I'm lazier to, be, <laughs> to start there. Yeah. Um, I can see, I call it constructive laziness. Okay. I trust people now. And before I did not me five years ago, wanted to do everything. I wanted a hand in everything. And if I had someone doing some work for the company, they were literally just an assistant or just a robot. And I was there fixing it, fixing whatever you, it was that they were doing because it wasn't exactly the way that I want it done. Mm. Now my evolution has been, this thing needs to get done. I'm looking at the organization outside of myself. It's not an extension of me. It's just mm -hmm. this idea that I came up with and it's working. Right. And so what does the organization need? It needs a marketing manager, it needs somebody that can really market it. Somebody with experience at like a big company that can push it like a big company. Mm -hmm. Let me find that person, hire them, pay them what they're worth and get out of their way. Tell mm -hmm. them like, this is the mission. This is the directive. This is the vision. How are we going to push that forward? How do we promote this? And then rely on their brain to do that part of the business. And then same with business development, same with social media, same with SEO there. We've got so many things going on now, Chris, I don't know how to use most of the, the tools that the team's using and, and that kind of stuff. I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm becoming less of an expert at all these things. And I'm yeah. just focusing on the vision and driving it forward and, and getting with the team and saying, Hey, look, this is what I want to do next. How are we going to do it? Let's put all these heads together and figure it out. 
So when so, did that mental shift happen? Was there something specific where yeah. you kind of realized that you couldn't micromanage everything or you couldn't control everything anymore? Was this a gradual evolution? Like yeah. what, how did you, how did you get meeting there? guys, meeting guys like you, yeah. honestly, um, <clears throat> getting, getting into contact and into close proximity to people that were doing the stuff that I wanted to do. It was the kink in my curve in my learning curve, because okay. it was like, okay, I'd never had really a network of people to like compare myself to. I, I don't know if that's the best word for it or the most healthy word, but I needed to see it done by people that were like me. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not, I'm not like you. You're twice my size. Uh, <laughs> you know, you got better hair and all that. I'm not stuff. twice your size. Yes, I do have better hair. No, yes, I'm older than you, you know? There's yeah. That. Well, you know what I mean? I, I have people to look up to and that's important to me. Um, and I have people to rely on in terms of like, Hey, am I doing this the right way? Like, what do you think? Like operationally and things like that, mm -hmm. that, that was really a, a big, big deal. So I'd say anybody who's listening and they feel like they're alone, you don't have to be, you should go out and find people like Chris, find consultants, find coaches and find your tribe, find your community and bounce your stuff off of them and just soak that up. You're the, you're going to be the average of the people you spend the most time with. You can improve that tomorrow by spending time with the right people. I want to ask you a question because I feel like, well, maybe you can relate to this. In this space, ethnicity-wise, my grandfather is from Mexico. My mother is from Taiwan. So there's probably yeah. not a whole lot of Taiwanese Mexicans in the agency space. You're African-American. When you say, you know, people that look like you in the minority space, you know, we are kind of lumped into that together. There's not a lot of minorities in the agency space. There's definitely not a lot of African Americans in the agency space. Has that ever had a impact on what you thought was possible? <laughs> no, never. Okay. <laughs> no, not once. It might have a lot. You know what? I'm I am African American technically, but my culturally, I and technically I'm Nigerian. My parents okay. are immigrants. So I'm the first person born on American soil in my entire, you know, family or whatever. So there's no excuse in that culture for not optimizing oneself. And I think a lot of people that come from immigrant backgrounds, yeah. they, they kind of feel the same way. Like it doesn't matter that you look different. You can still get things done in America. That's number one. So I never had that pre built in kind of woke liberal i'm a victim and there's a victimizer that i have to like deal with type of situation so not not having that limiting belief was important i think coming from the right background i grew up in a predominantly white suburb of la mm -hmm. if you can't tell by the sound of my voice and <laughs> you know i just didn't experience a lot of what people say that they experience yeah. not even in a that much of a nuanced way you know so i think i've been super fortunate in that my worldview hasn't been impacted by vicarious experiences or the experiences that i've had firsthand but i'll say to anybody who thinks that they're at a disadvantage because they're of color you're not that's just that's a limiting belief that you can switch off when you're ready uh, i'm living proof you're living proof the only color that matters in business is green man mm -hmm. you know uh, the CEOs of some of these huge, huge companies, they're brown, they're Indian, they're African-American. Some of them are white. Some of them are women. It just doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. So, and if somebody does care and they don't want to pay you because of what you look like, guess what? There are a million people right behind them that will pay you regardless of what you look like. So let it slide. Yeah. I love that attitude. I definitely think that it's one that we don't hear enough of. And that's why I wanted to ask you that question to inspire <laughs> others to believe that it is possible. And I'm not saying that there isn't racism or discrimination. Um, it, it like, I don't know, it was right before the pandemic when somebody told me to go back to Mexico. Oh. Ironically, I was living in Mexico, so I ended up driving back to Mexico <laughs> that day. So <laughs> joke's on you, motherfucker. I think um, I will. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> I am going back to Mexico, but that's not the point. I am going to beat your yeah. ass first. But anyways, I'm not saying that there's not discrimination. I'm not saying that there isn't racism. I'm not saying that it, that certain groups have it just as easy as other ones. But my belief is that somebody's got to win. It might as well be fucking me. You know, like, why can't yeah. I be the one who's going to win? And I think also like that kind of comes from my athletic, athletic background and you're an athlete as well. It's like, we might be the underdog, 
and we might lose if we played these guys 10 times we might lose nine times right yeah but who's to say that we can't win that one time today man that's such a great quote that's so that's so true and i i think it's so important that you mentioned that the athlete's mindset someone that's mm -hmm. been coached and has been taught that it doesn't matter that they're bigger than us faster than us stronger mm -hmm. than us with the right strategy and work ethic we don't even need luck we just need to do what we set out to do yeah do what you're trying to execute. do yep. yeah and execute and we can get it done yeah that's such a good point love that man we're about out of time it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you for anybody who is listening and is interested in learning from you or just wants to be friends with you what's the best way that they can get in contact with you whether that be social media or whatever no new friends all full so sorry <laughs> You can, you can reach out Austin at netflydigital.com and is a Nancy E-T-F-L-Y digital.com. Shoot me an email. Let's grab a digital coffee or a coffee in real life. I love talking about this stuff. I love talking business. I love talking growth. And I can always learn from everybody too. You know, um, doesn't matter what level we're at. If we work together, we're all going to reach the top in the end. So let's all reach the top. I love it, man. Thank you so much. I would highly recommend that you take up Austin on his offer. He's got an incredibly like unique and dry sense of humor. So you'll spend the entire time laughing, but it's like, it's like, like when you chat with him, it's like being on a TV show and I can't think of what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like the office, but it's like, uh, it's awesome. He's a really, really good dude and super, super yeah. funny. So thanks, man. Appreciate it. Awesome, that. man. Thank you so much. Oh, you know what? I just thought of one more question. How did you come up with the name NetFly Digital? That was purely technique. That was all tactic. So I wanted a word that I could purchase as a domain. Okay. I couldn't get NetFly.com. Some a-hole still sitting on it, but jokes okay. on him because I'm going to trademark it and then he's going to have to give it to me or you know, I'm going to buy it. But NetFly Digital was available. Okay. It's two words. It was six letters or less, which is like good for SEO. Okay. Uh, but I couldn't get NetFly.com, so whatever. But it provoked questions like like you're asking Why right now so i was like hey this is kind of good yeah net fly what does it mean and i can you know find a story later which i did so like internet, internet flyer which is what a website uh, is. i like yeah. it man good job thanks all right that's austin erebor reach out to him thank you so much thanks guys hey thank you for listening and if you enjoyed this episode it would mean so much to me if you would subscribe to the podcast and also share it with friends, family, and basically anyone you know who will find the same value in this episode as you do. So to get the latest from me, then let's connect on social media on the Facebooks at facebook.com forward slash dude agency or Instagram at dudeagency.io. Then you can also find us on LinkedIn, YouTube, and even TikTok. Yes, I'm that cool. We are on TikTok. Finally, go to our website at dudeagency.io, where you can see all of our other episodes of Operation Agency Freedom, register for live trainings on how to run a highly profitable agency, and you can see exactly how we help marketing agencies fix their operations and scale to eight figures and beyond. Thanks again for listening, and I will see you next time.